Hello, everybody, and welcome along. Uh, we are live on the 27th of March 2024, and we are coming to you today with a, a live stream for about an hour or so on the subject of, as the title suggests, cosmopolitanism and U.S. imperialist culture. And the reason why we're going to be talking about this is because what we're going to be uh, Um, has been uh, substituted for internationalism uh, by the bourgeoisie as a means of their, uh, as part of their ideological assault on uh, all forms of communism and all forms of working class power. And the form of cosmopolitanism that they have sold especially since World War II is what has come to define the culture of the ruling classes of Europe, Western Europe in particular, and indeed Eastern Europe. So um, we will begin. And for those who might uh, have noticed, uh, there is a new mic on the go. So if it is either too loud or too quiet, then be sure to let me know. So um, we will begin with the traditional greetings uh, through the chat. So we have C. Bolt with us who says, I do love a bit of cosmopolitanism. So hopefully I won't be in the wrong about that. Well, we will see. Uh, Dr. Ahmed joins us from Egypt. Uh, David Matthew is with us. David Capel is with us. Uh, Kl Klavek is with us. Uh, Putin Shirt joins us. Uh, Lee, good evening to you. Uh, working Prole Incorporated. Uh, hello to you. And uh, James Graham joins us and says Zed. Uh, Nicholas Kirchhoff joins us, uh, who says hello all. Uh, long time lurker and watcher of recordings. Uh, happy to be here live. Good to have you with us. Uh, okay, complaints about the. Uh, audio again. I'm going to turn that down to just plain old 100 and see if that makes any difference. Uh, okay, let me know if it's too loud, too quiet, etc. Right, so uh, we proceed. Now, uh, good uh, evening to Jenny who's joined us and Marty who joins us as well from New Mexico. Right, okay, so um, what do we mean then by uh, cosmopolitanism? Now, this is, of course, addressed uh, by actually uh, leading figures in the Communist Party of the Soviet Union in the immediate period after World War II. And it's addressed by uh, the likes of Andrei Zhdanov and others who were looking at the way in which the cultures of the uh, um, countries of uh, Western Europe that had been quote-unquote liberated by US and British imperialism were being uh, progressively subordinated to um, the uh, culture of the US imperialist bourgeoisie. And the, um, this was something that was a uh, part of a wider process of those nations being subsumed within a wider US imperialist structure. And this of course makes a good deal of sense because what um, happened after World War II, as we've mentioned here many times, was that the uh, the French and the British imperialists had, were, and of course West Germany, Italy, etc., and of course Spain too, which was included in the Marshall Plan. And what happened was, because these nations were reconstituted on the basis of loans and uh, aid from U.S. imperialism, it, and their status in the world was then uh, underpinned by U.S. imperialism. So, for instance, the U.S. backs up the uh, the Dutch in their war uh, to try and subdue Indonesia. Ultimately, the Dutch fail there. Uh, the um, uh, French, of course, attempt to uh, reconquer or uh, gain control back over um, what was then called French Indochina, 
later known as Vietnam, and of course Algeria. And all of this is backed up by U.S. imperialism. The British, of course, have a bit of a dispute with U.S. imperialism over their colonial possessions. The U.S., of course, wants to muscle in and get a slice of that action for itself uh, on the bay, and this is disguised uh, under. Um, the guise of um, yeah, freedom for small nations, but in reality it's muscling out the British and the French so that the U.S. can take the market share. It's a transfer of ownership, not anything more than that. The U.S. had in mind a far more, uh, to use Kwame and Krummer's later term, neo-colonial system than a direct colonial system. But they were prepared to back direct colonialism when it meant crushing uh, the movement of the masses towards a um, socialist system. Now, so what does this actually mean in terms of the culture? What is argued by uh, communist writers, indeed from the French Communist Party in the later 1940s, was that the, um, the culture of, of the bourgeoisie themselves was one that was actually being supplanted by American culture. And this is something which was justified by many on the uh, the in the reformist and later revisionist parties but the reformist parties in the 1940s principally those which were the social democratic allies of u.s imperialism principally the french socialists and the british labor party were very much in favor at least their leaders were of this progressive um uh Americanization of the culture and this pops up later on in um, the things like French new wave movies which are basically copying styles that come out of the United States um, various uh, French writers uh, complained in the 1940s that the number of uh, books that were just direct translations from uh, the United States was um, dramatically increasing that they would all show up in the uh, French schooling and uh, university system with courtesy of the Marshall Plan stamped on the front of them. So essentially the French were being reminded of the fact that their place in the world had been reconstituted by um, U.S. imperialism and was underpinned by U.S. imperialism. And of course the U.S. ruling class attempted to both shore up the position of the European powers whilst also uh, rem uh, uh, undermining them and essentially moving in as the new master in a lot of their former colonial possessions. So it's a very complex relationship, but it makes complete sense that um, what happened was these national cultures of the bourgeoisie were progressively surrendered over time in uh, order that their, the place of the, the national bourgeois is gradually supplanted by U.S. imperialism itself, or that the bourgeoisie in these countries is progressively subordinated to U.S. imperialism. It is not a straight-line process, uh, nor is it a process that happens overnight. The um, steady um, su um, submission of the bourgeoisies of the Western European countries happened over a, a long period of time. They were always... Um, going to submit when it came to questions of suppressing their own working class or um, essentially uh, or limiting the influence of communism in their in their countries uh, but they wanted to keep hold of their market share and they wanted to keep hold of uh, their domination over the neo-colonial world so the uh, submission of uh, national cultures of uh, Western Europe to the culture of U.S. imperialism took a long time to play out, and it was stronger in some countries than in others. But as you go into the 1960s, you can see it starting to manifest itself everywhere. You can see, for instance, that when it came to, for instance, having a domestic film industry, uh, the British bourgeoisie had a base essentially given up by the end of the 1960s, like the um, the the big uh, British productions uh, that had uh, existed even just a few years earlier had all started to bite the dust. The British bourgeoisie were really no longer that interested in producing British films. Uh, they were interested in acting as a base for the shooting of American films. And so you get the, essentially, the, the takeover or, or of... Um, British filmmaking by Hollywood money, by American money. 
from the late 60s through to the early 80s. And so what you get, get is that a lot of British directors, a lot of British screenwriters, um, technical people work on um, Hollywood productions in British studios such as Pinewood and Shepperton. Um, so, for instance, like a lot of the Star Wars movies are shot there. Um, uh, the the uh, Blade Runner movie, the original, uh, the good one, is shot there. And it's the same process does occur in France, but it occurs on a much slower timeline. So, for instance, the, the French bourgeoisie were a little bit more split about the um, their relationship with, the, with U.S. imperialism than the British were. The British went for straight up... Um, a, a bargain as soon as they could get one and, and it would be mean them willingly playing a subordinate role but getting to cling on to certain things so they get to uh, hang on to certain bits of business um, that are done through the city of London as is chronicled uh, by the um, the work of Tony Norfield in his work in the city so for instance the city of London continues to outperform Wall Street in a couple of key areas all the way through to recent years and they get that by willingly submitting themselves to US imperialism and a whole range of other issues and essentially acting as US imperialism's pilot fish quite a lot of the time. The French bourgeois after the crisis in, uh, in the, over the Suez Canal in 1956 where they regarded um, US imperialism as having betrayed them when it didn't, it didn't back up their scheme to invade Egypt, uh, a plot they cooked up with the, the Zionists in the form of the Israeli colonial state. The British chose willing submission. The French chose partial defiance. So you get the de Gaulle era and the, uh, the dreams of the, uh, the French bourgeois that essentially they are going to recreate a greater France uh, through the um, the construction of the, uh, the what became the European Economic Com Community and then the the European Union later on that um, idea that was animated by de Gaulle and certain bourgeois French intellectuals uh, came into play in the um, in the late fifties and early nineteen sixties, which is why de Gaulle didn't want the British to join uh, the EEC as it was known back then. Uh, came out of the European coal and steel community. The idea of de Gaulle's was we are going to exert French influence over this new European uh, community and it will help France retain its place in the world by essentially having a Europe r politically run by France and economically run by West Germany. Of course, as we've pointed out before, the flaw in that particular thinking was that West Germany was very much dominated I mean, almost completely by uh, US imperialism. What autonomy had actually didn't last that much longer after the end of the Cold War. What autonomy its leaders had um, was only as much as the US was prepared to cede to it. And after unification, its uh, strategic autonomy got, actually got less. But we go back to the culture question. What does this, this domination by U.S. imperialism mean? Um, it means a number of things. Uh, the, one of the big things that um, happens is that after World War II, you start to get a number of intellectual trends in Britain and in Europe especially, which moved towards this, this very liberal idea and the, the, stemming from the liberal interpretation of um, what caused World War II. Um, and I'm sure many of you uh, have watching this have gone through the uh, arduous and boring process of being taught um, bourgeois history in schools. And this actually is an interpretation which is also taught at university level. Um, they tell you um, over and over again that the reason why uh, World War I and World War II came about was because of nationalism, because of competing nationalisms. This is a very, this is the liberal, British liberal hist history being taught. And that therefore um, all nationalism is bad. Um, and you don't, you shouldn't look at the content of it. It's just nationalism bad. And they counterpose to that. Uh, this idea, especially in the, this was especially true in like the 90s and the 2000s, but it started in the 40s, of the, the idea of the unified Europe being counterposed to the earlier ugly 
nationalisms. And of course, the unified Europe as an idea was immediately embraced. Um, this goes back, as I said, all the way to the European coal and steel community. The idea of um, this was sold by people like Jean Monnet, one of the founders of the, um, the idea of a European Union, was that this United States of Europe would eliminate the, um, the nationalism that had created World War I and World War II and would, that would manage conflict in Europe and would be able thus to um, create, in Joseph Burrell's words, a wonderful garden um, that um, various uh, people on the edge of Europe aren't allowed access to. So this was, uh, the idea was that Europe would overcome its divisions, would create a common and uh, shared culture that would manifest all the most wonderful bits of European civilizations with the ugly bits cut off of it. And this was something which, uh, um, reached um, its strongest point um, in, in, the, in the, the sense of having a cultural impact, I think, in the 90s and 2000s, when I experienced it, in, a, in the late 90s and early to mid 2000s, when there was this idea that was being propagated by a section, actually, also of the British ruling class, that there was going to be this, uh, again, this is the, the, the propaganda around globalization from the European and part of the British perspective was this idea that there was going to be this wonderful shared culture going across Europe, which, of course, is a reflection of the idea of a common European market. It, but it is a very much a a, a a Europe unified by monopolies, a, a Europe unified by German manufacturing monopolies, um, Dutch agricultural monopolies. Uh, French banking monopolies, British banking monopolies, and this was the sort. This is the real source of the unified Europe that they sought. Of course, there were a myriad of contradictions in that, and ultimately, the idea of the unified Europe cannot possibly succeed under capitalism, because no matter how much they tried to subordinate uh, national bourgeois interests into uh, under this idea of a unified Europe, um, they couldn't, they could never quite get there because, of course, what it meant was it wasn't really a unified Europe. Again, to go back to what I previously said, it was a Europe that represented the interests of various monopolists. So, for instance, um, German manufacturing monopolies used the uh, collapse of um, the uh, people's democracies and Yugoslavia to essentially conquer uh, via their manufactured goods the markets of many of these countries and through their joining of the European Union and the, ne the, de the deconstruction or destruction of any trade barriers they used their position to destroy um, the manufacturing bases that many of these countries inherited from the socialist period and this was also true for capitalist countries as well like the um, the mem membership of the e the euro for a country like Greece or a country like Portugal, in actual fact, ended up um, severely damaging, if not nearly completely destroying, the domestic manufacturing base, because the different currencies um, in the for particularly for the smaller countries of Europe were the last thing that were a, was a barrier to German manufacturing smashing down the door and essentially monopolizing the, uh, the market for manufactured goods. Especially true of Greece. And part of the reason why the Greeks ended up borrowing so much in the later 2000s and the, the early to mid 2000s and then there was the Greek debt crisis in the later 2000s and early 2010s was to, in order for them to buy German manufactured goods and also of course then they had to borrow more money to pay down the debt on the previous loans and it's the reason why of course Merkel insisted upon uh, full repayment of all debts and was prepared to uh, uh, eviscerate uh, the Greek economy in the process and just look at the uninterrupted downward spiral that's happened in Greece since then. Now they're passing bills through Parliament calling for the extension of the working week to 120 hours. So this idea of a unified Europe which was sold as this wonderful uh, post, post World War II then post Cold War idea of the, the Europe that has overcome all of the contradictions put in there by nationalism and nationalism like another is another term 
much like democracy uh, or the state or any uh, anything else which refers to um, a form of uh, political organization or a form of ideology where if nobody stick uh, adds to it the form of the class form that that takes or the form that it takes in terms of whether it is a reaction to imperialism or a product of imperialism then you're essentially dealing with a liberal interpretation if they're not going to give you that um that that more holistic view of things that all-around view of things that uh, marxism leninism can give you so the the dream of the unified europe um lasts really um only really about eight or nine years after the launch of the euro um the whole question of like what was going to become of Europe was one that was like filled with optimism prior to 2007-2008 uh, when everybody when the uh, the crisis very much um, hit and what became obvious was that well the 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 dream was always an illusion we're, let's then we, we've talked a, more about why this is a, a Europe of the monopolists. So let's step back to the cosmopolitanism question, how it connects to American imperialism. This, of course, was used by uh, American imperialism throughout the um, post World War II period and has been used ever since then. Um, this idea of the um, the post state future, um, a uh, place without borders. Um, a place without, um, again, uh, nationalism, various different kinds. This idea was something that was very much um, sold in Europe in the, um, the 1940s, 1940s onwards. And after we get the complete collapse of um, the Soviet Union and, and the uh, for most forms of actually existing socialism, what's sold in the 90s via um, various different intellectual trends the, the the dumber of which is somebody like thomas friedman um the more intellectual of them would be somebody who actually came from the marxist tradition which is of course antonio negri and his book his abominable book empire which manages to be as pretentious and as empty as a u2 song um what you get in the the 90s and early 2000s both from the pro and anti-globalization people a, from both sides of this argument is the idea that the the nation state is redundant and out of date and this was an idea that many in um, the imperialist world have been pushing for a long time um, because of course they were trying to argue that there was no need for uh, strong nation states coming out of the uh, those countries that had recently declared independence and won their independence um, and that well, all they needed to do was to engage in the wonderful global system of international trade and this really intensifies after the end of the cold war and so you see from the pro and anti-globalization side in the late 90s and early 2000s this idea that the, the nation state was over and this is said with great joy by the advocates of globalization as it was called and it's said the same almost the same way from the supposed critics so if you read negri hart and negri's book empire which i wouldn't bother to be honest with it's um, one of the worst pieces of um, so-called philosophy i've ever read the only things that uh, come close to being this pretentious and this useless at the same time would be various things written by the French post-structuralists um, or the work of someone like J.F. Lyotard. Um, horrendous book. But they said the essence of its argument was that, and they weren't alone in this um, heart and negri, was that the nation state was now completely redundant, that it was transnational corporations or multinational corporations that were the, uh, and the international financial institutions that were actually the real rulers of the world now this is the empire now whereas of course what was actually going on was if you actually look at the um, foundations of the international monetary fund or the world trade organization or the world bank then you trace their origins and they go all, most of them go the go back to um, well the world bank and the imf certainly the post-world war ii period and have been founded essentially by 
uh, U.S. and imperialism with British imperialism playing the junior role, and that they share ownership of these, and the Europeans get in on the action as well, uh, France and Germany in particular. And so, when you actually looked at what was being presented as the the, the globalized world, which um, all countries should join, indeed must join, uh, then uh, you can have access to not only a realm of, to use Kant's old phrase, perpetual peace, but you can also now be part of a um, peaceful, um, tolerant um, culture that would do away with all divisiveness, that would um, overcome racism, that would overcome um, sexism, that would overcome all forms of prejudice that have been associated even with earlier forms of capitalist rule. Because now we we're in a future where um, social class no longer mattered. We had serious, supposedly serious bourgeois academics in Britain in the 1990s and 2000s arguing that, the, that not only was Britain a classless society now, because the, the, the class divisions had all vanished uh, back in the 1960s and 70s. And this, you actually read some of this stuff, it is cartoonishly bad. But what they essentially argued was that, well, the uh, the British ruling class is now no longer um, dominated by the aristocracy, which is only partially true, and therefore anybody can join it. Anybody, the, the, anybody can join the ruling class now. Uh, the old barriers no longer exist. The barriers to women's participation in capitalism are all gone. Capitalism is a great leveler and will do, a re do away with racism. This is the wonderful culture that you can join, personified by, of course, the old United Colors of Benetton advert. Uh, of course, this was tripe, um, as it always is. What, in actual fact, happened is the more they said uh, is that the more they said that class no, was no longer relevant in Britain or indeed any of the imperialist countries, class became ever more relevant because the class divisions became starker and the exploitation of the working class became greater, as did the exploitation in the most brutish manner of the uh, peoples of the neo-colonial world. But again, we return back to the culture question and what happens after the, uh, the 90s and after the um, fall of the USSR is that um, the culture of the imperialist bloc is becoming more and more homogenized because the, the barriers to the movement of capital between the various different parts of the US-dominated bloc uh, get, slowly get eroded and taken down. The actual uh, national cultures of these countries get diluted more and more uh, as the, uh, the, the bourgeoisie of these countries, whether they're aware of it or not, become ever more subordinated to US imperialism. The French, again, try to protect their national cinema a little bit more than the British do, but I would say only to varying degrees of success, to more success than Britain had, uh, but not, not to the point where they could resist the, um, the tidal wave of awful um, coming out of um, Hollywood. And as, of course, we've covered before, through the 90s into the 2000s, what you get in Hollywood itself, uh, monopolization, um, moves to um, the, the the Hollywood studios merge with each other. Um, they merge more and more with um, the uh, financialized capitalism until in the end what you get now is of course um, the major entertainment studios are essentially funded by uh, either big tech or big finance. Uh, and the idea of the, the old-fashioned movie mogul who might have made his money elsewhere but made uh, made his money back on his um, on his investments in cinema, um, that's kind of bit in the dust. These are now just essentially vanity projects for um, the cor corporations uh, that are involved mainly in making their money in tech, such as Amazon or Apple. So what you get is homogenization. Um, both inside the center of U.S. imperialism itself and much more widely across the U.S. imperialist vassal states um, the, that happens um, the, the, the way you see um, so-called well, the, the sovereignty of these vassal states gets eroded because essentially the bourgeoisie of these countries has decided to surrender it. They, the process went on um, a long time um, again, to reiterate the point, it goes on for over 70 years after the end of World War II up to today, almost 80 years now. 
Uh, but what happens is, um, s slowly but surely, the bourgeoisies of all the nations of Europe give up on sovereignty completely. This is true for even bourgeoisies that were born out of uh, nationalist struggles, such as um, you look at the development of the bourgeoisie in Ireland, which was always a rather truncated uh, being, I would say. Uh, Irishmen watching this might have things to say about this, but in my view, uh, from the, the beginnings of the, uh, the Irish Free State, there was a bit of a back and forth between some more uh, ambitious elements in the Irish bourgeois, perhaps personified in the figure of Eamon de Valera. But I think after the after the sixties and after I think the the attempt at Irish import substitution um, ended uh, by the eighties. I think you've got to the point where like there's the the nature of the Irish bourgeois is relentlessly comprador. In uh, if it's not prepared to subordinate itself to British imperialism, which it very much had already, I think. Uh, it was also now subordinating itself to uh, German uh, imperialism, but mostly US imperialism. And so the from the smaller nations to the larger nations, because the of the outsized role of US imperialism on in the economic sphere, and the slowly diminishing role of even the bigger and more powerful countries in Europe, such as Germany and France, and of course British imperialism slowly losing its place, what you get now is a block of countries which is just dominated economically by US imperialism and thus dominated culturally by it as well. And culture doesn't just mean, of course, films, doesn't just mean novels, doesn't just mean any other art, culture, or entertainment um, that you might engage in or you might indulge in. It means that, of course, the the ideas that are derived uh, in this period become ever more poverty-stricken because essentially what, what is the wellspring that they are drawing from? First of all, not only is it the case that when examining cultural products, you can't just examine the product itself. You can't just examine the novel or examine the film or the piece of music. These are derived out of a system of production. And what is the, you know, the mode of production that from which these uh, cultural products are derived? And that is, of course, the, a system in, the, in whether you're British, French, German, Italian, Irish, Spanish, Portuguese, or indeed America itself. What we are all, all of our cultures now, are dominated by what? Decaying U.S. imperialism, which is has dressed itself up in increasingly cosmopolitanist um, clothing to hide the decay. And this goes to um, the very why various different intellectual fads are promoted to paper over the cracks. So this is why when, for instance, um, you got the the taking of the knee, for instance, as a both a cultural and a political trend. Uh, remember after the uh, the murder of uh, George Floyd, uh, the uh, the taking of the knee protests uh, took off in American sports. I think I'm right in saying. And then they were brought over into uh, British sport, which seemed a little odd because, of course, allegedly we're a different country. But what it, re it was very revealing and very useful uh, cultural and political phenomenon because it revealed that the the elite in in all forms of culture in this country it wasn't just a shadowy plot or something like that it's that the and i know people who work in these um, various different cultural institutions be they more artistic or intellectual or sporting and these people's minds are completely colonized by us imperialism they don't know it they don't see britain as anything other than an extension of the United States. Now, some of them embrace that. Some of them are a little bit unhappy about that. So, and these are generally people who are from the petty bourgeoisie or uh, had their origins in the working class and then became part of the, the labor aristocracy via their ability to move through various different cultural bureaucracies or government bureaucracies. And what what the whole take the knee thing revealed was the fact that yes a, a huge chunk of the um, people who are employed in the business of culture in this country do to see no differentiation at all between the united states and britain 
uh, they they might be aware on some level that they've got a British passport. They uh, they might complain about being British from time to time, but to, in their mind, Britain and the United States are as one, um, and that that's why this took off. And it took off, and of course, got embraced by the big players in U.S. culture as, of course, a weapon to drive people. Uh, as did uh, when the the uh, the U.S. Democratic Party representing us uh, the most at this stage or at that stage the most powerful sections of the u.s bourgeois adopted black lives matter and adopted the the taking of the knee stance and you got to see chuck schumer with a kente cloth scarf on taking the knee in the senate what a wonderful image for racial equality um when all of these power players adopt something um the um whole um Struck superstructure of um, their vassal states adopt it as well and this is particularly true of Britain where again the cultural and political elite see themselves as all exactly the same as the American elites they see themselves as completely conjoined with it and this is true of the the left of that elite and the right the left embrace Kente cloth and take the knee and BLM and Barack Obama back in the day I mean, just a side note, there was a discussion uh, that went on in the Telegram group earlier today about, about Obama. And, and then he is an interesting cultural product as well, um, cultural and political product. Because he, when, when he was on his very, very carefully marketed rise, I don't know who, uh, how many of you will remember, but he did this ridiculous tour around Europe as a, a man who was like a, a two-year duration U.S. senator was drawing crowds of what tens of thousands in Berlin. I was getting like this rock star reception. He, he'd been very carefully marketed as a political and cultural product, clearly. Um, but the, over here, I remember this at the time. There were like DJs on the radio who were like uh, on the BBC who were like um, getting emotional about uh, the, pro the the prospect of a black president, and they were talking as if um, he was their president. And now that struck me as strange at the time, but when you think about it, it makes complete sense because the ruling class of this country on whether by that time, by 2010, the, uh, the pro-US side had almost entirely won the argument within the ruling class, like the last flurry of ruling class opposition to sort of um, a uh, thoroughgoing transatlanticism uh, had been in 2003 and 2004. And the so the people in the cultural production spheres in this country by like 2008 didn't see a borderline between Britain and America at all. They can they had completely absorbed the idea that this was essentially just one country. Only difference is that the the 51st state had a national health service and the rest of the other 50 states didn't. That was about the only difference. And they, they might piss and moan, but they don't piss and moan about American imperialism. They piss and moan about um, its crude aspects. Um, the, the, that's why they got so upset with George W. Bush. It's why they got so upset with Trump. Not because of anything that they did. I mean, you know, Obama continued the George W. Bush legacy, um, but it's just remarketed. And, of course, you, know, you have now Joe Biden, very much continuing the Trump legacy. Who continued the Obama legacy? But the uh, the, the the liberals, the left liberals uh, in this country get very upset about figures like w, George W. Bush and Trump for being too crude, for being too aggressive, for ruining the branding of the wonderful transatlantic system. And they embrace, they loved Obama so much because again, he was the great makeover for that system. Uh, George W. Bush was uh, made these people very uncomfortable. Uh, Obama could do all the same things as George W. Bush, of course, but could do it as the first black president. And so he got a lot done for imperialism. And these people absolutely adored him and still do. Um, I had a conversation with a guy who runs a second-hand bookstore just down the road from me. And the uh, I was I was buying for like a, a bargain basement price one of Obama's dreadful autobiographies which are very revealing and you, and you should read them if you can get hold of them for like i don't know a dollar or 50 cents if you're in america because 
you marvel at the narcissism and shallowness of the man really just awful shit but very 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 interesting from the perspective of trying to understand this figure and um and so the, the it may like i said it makes complete sense that he would come to that this man who was the relaunch of american imperialism following the setback for in the george w bush era uh where trying to sell a sort of a combination of sort of a reaganism on steroids it hadn't gone very well in terms of the the image of u.s imperialism with its uh with its vassals so what do you do you rebrand it and that's why obama is such, is such a shady figure he was the perfect face for um cosmopolitan imperialism he really with his backstory whether it's real or imaginary with the fact that he's the first black president with the fact that um he embraces openly or he did when it was politically convenient various different trends that are now uh, derided by very popular online commentators as woke and leaning into all of that it was a real rebranding of american imperialism after the bush era it did all the same things as the bush era but it did so in the end whilst frenetically waving a rainbow flag and of course embracing various forms of what is now called identity politics and this was of course very useful uh, for the u.s ruling class in serving to uh, dilute and divert any attempt at the re-emergence of even the most basic form of class politics obama was wonderful for the branding of u.s imperialism and he was the absolutely perfect face for this sort of late stage decaying u.s imperialism to give itself a, a literal facelift and remarket itself around the world i mean the meme of um the difference between the uh, republicans and the democrats being a b-52 with an american flag on it dropping bombs for the republicans and a b-52 with the pride flag on it and black lives matter written on the side for the democrats make it's a meme but you can learn a not learn a lot from a meme if it's done particularly well and that one does sum that up so again like now now let's talk a little bit more about what we what we've what we can learn from cosmopolitanism and how we counterpose that to um proletarian culture cosmopolitanism is not what it portrays itself to be it is not a free um and uh, open ex uh, expression of a coming together of different cultural traditions it's essentially a product that is delivered to you a concentrated and hyper diluted form of various different cultures delivered to you by a largely u.s owned corporation it is the um, annihilation of all the positive things of national culture including u.s national culture by the way i know we've got some americans watching this it's in, it in, and i'm sure you are aware the the decay of american imperialism and u.s cosmopolitan imperialism means not only the annihilation of the the cultures of the european vassal states but it also means the annihilation of all the positive aspects of even u.s bourgeois culture why is it that um a certain section of the u.s bourgeoisie was willing to embrace a boiled down completely uh, bastardized version of uh, western maoism in the form of like uh, sponsoring different aspects of national nihilism in their cont contest with the the lower bourgeois and petty bourgeois who are backing the republicans and trump uh, because in the end what does uh, this dying imperialism have to offer in the cultural sphere uh, what did, what it did um, successfully with obama was it appeared to renounce part of the uh, racialist past of um, the u.s ruling class and some of the u.s ruling class who are trying to think their way into another remake or another makeover of u.s hegemony looked at the obama success and thought right well we did a bit of a makeover there and we appeared to renounce the uh, the 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 back the, uh, the the racialist period in american history so what we we should go further with that in capacity when we're fighting the orange bad guy 
So this is why they end up sponsoring, uh, well, BLM for a start, why they end up engaging in this national nihilism of like where you get like pseudo Maoist moron professors turning up and like saying that they're decolonizing American television uh, or they're, you know, uh, they're engaging in some kind of cultural revolution by uh, getting a Dumbo script through a, um, a media monopoly to be adapted into a Disney product or something like that. This uh, a national nihilism in the United States is, of course, fueled by intra-ruling class conflict whereby one section of the ruling class decides that it's a good idea to sponsor these um, you know bastardizations of various different forms of um, Maoism of post of like col uh, post-colonial theory and things like that and apply them in a very crude and dumbed down in really idiotic way to US history and so that they end up tearing up their own history in order to try and bind people to this um, newly made over form of US cultural hegemony, which is all about the appearance of a good old traditional Catholic flagellation, but in actual fact is essentially a giant piece of sort of um, self-congratulation. Look at us, look at how much we can renounce of our past. Uh, whilst in actual fact not renouncing anything that really matters in the in the form of imperialism but of course using the fact that they can engage in national nihilism and destroy their own cultures just as they're you know this this does start from an economic point of view imperialism hollows out and destroys the productive economic base of all of the countries that it derives from so following on from that that it would ultimately hollow out and destroy even the positive aspects of our previous american bourgeois culture that makes complete sense and therefore and what's happened over the past five to ten years in the united states partially deriving from of course media monopolization the mergers and acquisitions that have gone through in the hollywood system and the cultural sphere but also deriving from the need of the u.s ruling class to keep remaking itself as um, the economy further hollows out as the power of u.s imperialism comes into question well they need another makeover what to do they're pushed down the root root of national nihilism and that's why you get all these like very stupid um, university professors on obscene amounts of money like Ibram X. Kendi going around. A complete con man, but one who was elevated by a certain section of the bourgeois because he gave them a new um, form, um, a cultural form that they could play with and incorporate into their um, form of um, cosmopolitanism. Look at us, we can renounce our past. Aren't we great? You should join us. And that this became a new thing that they could sell to their various different democracy foundations all over the world, of course. Then you can, you too can join us. You too can join us and renounce various things of your past. But all of your past will now be reframed via this sort of bastardized version of the American experience. So what you end up with if you're going through these American-sponsored academic training courses is not an, an understanding of your country's actual past. What you end up with is a curated version of your country's past filtered through the un, a so-called understanding of the American imperialist education system, which has been imposed upon your country in a new form of uh, neo-colonialism, which seeks to subordinate and dominate a domestic cultural and intellectual elite in order that U.S. imperialism can control not only the economic sphere, but of course, vitally, the sphere of ideas as well, the sphere of culture. And so you get ridiculous things like um, in the former Soviet countries, like all the people who want to go into intellectual or or, cult, or cultural sphere well that all of that is dominated completely by u.s imperialism they've and british imperialism there trust me i used to work in this field they've invested a lot of money and a lot of resources 
advancing through the different um, education systems, taking over via either grants, uh, funding different courses, or in uh, forcing through di privatization of school education or higher education in particular, um, training academics in uh, the United States and then taking them back over to their home countries to implant the U.S. imperialist view of the world. The culture of these countries is dominated by products that come out of U.S. imperialism, and it's all covered over with the veneer of cosmopolitanism. So going back to the point about what can actually defeat this like uh, wretched and plasticated bastardized culture, which has been enforced on many different areas of the world, and the answer is only the form, it only comes in the form of the fact that the revolutionary proletariat is the only class and the, the, the revolution, the proletarian revolution is the only way that you can overcome this. Now, in countries suffering from neo-colonialism, of course, this is a little bit different in that there were, uh, still exist various different aspects of perhaps the other classes. Uh, there can even be elements of a national bourgeoisie in certain countries and in, uh, in the African nations, for instance, where a, a coalition of classes between proletariat, peasantry, petty bourgeois and national bourgeois might still be possible. Indeed, is possible in certain countries, and we shouldn't ignore that. But when it comes to my own country, when it comes to the European nations who were drawn into this cosmopolitanism and have, through 60 years of it, have ended up with, with cultural tripe um, for, um, for, for breakfast, so to speak, um, the only way out is if the only way you're going to be able to possibly break out of this is through the proletarian revolution. And so you only break out of it in, and are able then to renew all these nations in the economic and the cultural sphere via the active intervention of the proletariat through uh, the actions of the vanguard party. Now, it's important to emphasize that there were very, there were mistaken uh, analyses done on cosmopolitanism by the communist parties in including in Britain uh, with the idea being um, that the, they could fight the US domination by siding with uh, progressive elements or um, nationalistic elements within the bourgeoisie this was something that was discussed in the um, the discussions around the British road to socialism of the old Communist Party of Great Britain and they they thought that the there would be elements within the bourgeois who would resent being subordinated to um, US imperialism now of course there were a few but given the advanced monopolist nature of the uh, the British ruling class and the fact that they completely dominated um, British capitalism, They, the overwhelming majority of the bourgeoisie were completely happy with subordination, or if not completely happy, they're more than happy to submit to it, to subordination to US imperialism. And the problem that the Communist Party in this country ended up creating for itself by thinking that it could secure the allegiance of a, a rogue bit of the bourgeoisie, which is always possible in a revolutionary situation, because they didn't consider the question in an all-around fashion, what they ended up doing was rather than bringing over elements of the, um, the bourgeoisie and the petty bourgeoisie over to the cause of the working class via the strength of the proletariat and the strength of, the, um, of, the commun of its Communist Party, what they ended up doing was, was doing the opposite, which was continuously pandering to what they imagined would be a element of the bourgeois that would object to domination by uh, the U.S. monopolies. <clears throat> and this leads them to a whole range of mistakes because, again, they they rather than bring over people via the strength of the proletariat and by convincing the uh, rogue bourgeois elements that their proletariat is advancing as the next ruling class, as the ruling class to come. And therefore, if you are serious about wanting to see a better future for this country, then you better come over to the side of the proletariat. Rather than doing it that way, they went the other way and tried to constantly adapt their program and dilute it to an imagined rogue bit of the bourgeoisie that never really emerged. And that's why you've got to consider things in the way of constantly assessing the situation as to, well, how do we win the allegiance of other classes? 
It's not via pandering to them. It's via strengthening the organization of the proletariat, strengthening the organization of the Communist Party within the proletariat. And once the strength of the organized working class has been demonstrated, at that point, you will start to get defections from the bourgeoisie. You don't do it via pandering. Right. Um, I started early tonight because I got to be up criminally early in the morning. So that's why uh, we kicked off a little bit early. So I need to finish on the hour. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, zip through some comments. Uh, okay, Yepex, good evening to you or good afternoon to you out there in Minnesota. Beju, good evening to you, comrade. Tim Gray says you can link what has happened within the, the art world with the development of postmodernism in the late 70s and early 80s. Neoliberal art, meaningless and a vehicle for the rich to avoid tax. Good point. We should do, actually, I need to do something on postmodernism and art because that's a fascinating area where uh, we need to discuss the meaning of meaninglessness. Uh, Morgan says, John Monet professors are worth keeping an eye on. They are littered throughout Irish universities. Yeah, very true. Uh, muzzle paint. So Solidarity Comrades, live from the ruins of Key Bridge. We will visit, be visiting the Key Bridge scandal tomorrow. Daryl Davis says, but on, uh, not on topic, but on what you were talking about regarding Iraq yesterday. So Iraqi communists split on Hussein. Pro-Soviets lined up behind uh, Hussein. Pro-Chinese did not with tra tragic results. Interesting. Again, I, I will need to revisit the um, Iraqi communist split there. Um, in a future episode. Tim Gray says, interestingly, at the end of the Western Roman Empire, its cultural output was dominated with nihilistic self-destruction and mysticism. I'll just simply look at the camera and let you draw your own conclusion. Um, GCCX Pro says, 20,000 German bozos were attending Obama. Yeah, <laughs> I remember that. Um, Daryl Davis says, I'm so happy the UK didn't do to Rishi what uh, was done to Obama. Well, in fairness, like, um, the history is different. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, the British ruling class have, uh, were and are incredibly racist. But um, it's always been a little bit different here, I think, because there wasn't the formal um, segregation system here. There's informal segregation. But again, it's much more based on class than race in Britain. The, again, there is racism, but it's not quite the same. And particularly with regard to Rishi Sunak, who's an incredibly rich Indian guy, he's rather hard to sell as a, as a, as a, uh, a, a success story who's come from nothing. Like, he's, um, he's a guy who's so rich, like he doesn't even remember how many houses he's got. So, yeah, and also Obama, even though he's a vile bastard, um, was able to act the part of the great charismatic leader. Rishi Sunak is as charismatic as a spent match. Bob Parr says, Obama came through the dodgiest Chicago politics. Rumors are abound about him being uh, spotted while a child. His mother was rumored to be from a free letter agency. Well, his stepfather was. His stepfather was um, a CIA asset who worked in Indonesia and I think was involved with organizing the genocide in 1965. So certainly a dodgy family history. And his old man, his actual father, came to the U.S. on a, um, on a paid scholarship as well uh, to be trained at an American university. President Jesus says, My favorite uh, was NBA, NBA players wearing slogans like group economics on the back of their jerseys after Obama stepped in to stop a player strike. Yeah, the fact that they listened to him just shows that they're where, where a lot of those guys' class interests actually are. Uh, the, I think the very well-paid players, at least. Putin's shirt said the same thing happened with Greta Thunberg as with Obama. Well, they certainly tried. She skyrocketed into fame overnight. I could have spat on the steps of the Swedish embassy with a poster for 100 years and never been known at all. Yeah, because her parents were, I think, like her mother was an actress, I believe, and her father was or is, I should say, something big in finance. Uh, I think, anyway, they're certainly like the kind of parents who can push their kid into a life of stardom. And the stardom they chose was the stardom of activism. And it certainly paid off well for them. Kevin Ackletver says, Catholic Church knows second son is coming. 
Our third secret of Fatima Leaks in Night in Zagreb series by Adam Medvidovich in the form of a novel, Epstein Island, Using Double, etc., Snake from the East. Interesting series of comments there. I won't pretend I understand, understood any of that. If you'd like to clarify it, please do so. Trump was a complete departure from Obama. I don't agree with you, Daryl. Uh, Trump was better, was way better than Obama. Uh, no, I don't agree with you. Um, Obama is a terrible asshole. Trump's much funnier. Um, like I'd, I'd rather, if I had to choose, I'd rather go for a game of golf with Trump. It would be very entertaining. But there's a lot of continuity between Obama and Trump. Um, there's some differences. But as uh, we found out in the second Trump impeachment, the fact that there is a lot of continuity isn't necessarily down to the individual. It's down to the fact that the, the American state remains permanent, as all states do. Uh, just remember the words of Vindman, uh, Colonel Vindman, a uh, uh, great Ukrainian patriot, and the second Trump impeachment trial, which is that when he said that Trump had departed from the foreign policy of the United States. And he meant it as well. He meant it because as far as he was concerned, the foreign policy of the United States was decided by the state bureaucracy. The president comes and goes, but the state is permanent. Darrell says, I grew to hate Obama. I didn't always, but he was horrible. I never liked the fucker, I got to admit, from the start. Um, the, uh, um, I, the, the adoration of him I always found fucking nauseating. Um, Beju says, Obama had the quality of talking elegantly at length but actually saying nothing. Sounding great to liberals but with no meaning. And as liberals, um, including left liberals, value aesthetics over everything else, that's why that part of the reason why they fell for his charms. Potted Rodent says, Obama was the orator the new empire needed at the time. Very true. GCCX Pro says, left cosmopolitanism equals Trotskyism. Very much does a lot of the time. Um... I'm going to have to skip through um, some of this because I need to knock off in a minute. Daryl Davis says, Obama kicked black people in the teeth. Obama screwed the black bourgeoisie. Black bourgeois money largely comes from doing business with China, which Obama was gearing up to destroy. That's a good point, actually, from Daryl Davis there. Uh, they, the, the, the trade war with China actually began under Obama. Um, Trump furthered it, but... The idea of uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership was to drain investment away from China and into other countries in the Pacific re region. Beiju says in the, in the UK, the ruling class likes to dish out OBEs and MBEs, showing everybody that the ruling class still believes in the, the British Empire exists in some form. Well, comrade, it does. It's just now it's neocolonialism and imperialism run via... Um, ultra-financialized uh, ultra capitalism, not direct occupation of places as such anymore, but domination via trade, via the uh, global financial system, and limited military presences in certain countries. Um, Lee, glad you enjoyed the stream. Um, good to have you with us. Uh, Couple Quiz Cray says, do you know the HKP, People's Liberation Party in Turkey? I have heard of them, but I don't know a lot, not enough about them to comment on them. So if you have stuff about them that you think I should read, send them to the email address. Zo Zo Zota says, oil paintings have always been a financial asset of the rich. The book Ways of Seeing is great on this. Yes, by uh, John Berger, I think. All right. So... I'm going to have to knock off for tonight because uh, uh, I will be needing to get up very, very early in the morning. If I've missed your uh, comments on cosmopolitanism uh, and you want me to pick something up, then be sure to email them to me and I'll throw them into the Q&A at the weekend. Uh, but I got to knock off now, so I will say uh, thank you to everybody, all 244 of you who are watching, 136 on X and 108 on YouTube. Uh, I'll be back with you again tomorrow, and uh, there will be coming up this weekend a couple of um, specials I've had on the boil for a while now to be announced uh, tomorrow. Thank you, everybody, and good night.